Um, so this morning's theme is going to talk about trying to get somewhere very quickly. Uh, we've talked about some interstellar missions the last couple days. Uh, and like uh, <clears throat> Richard talked about when he was doing the intro this morning, uh, some of the transit times associated with that have been measured in centuries and millennia. Uh, but what do you need to do if you want to try and change that transit time to something measured in uh, weeks, months, or maybe even years? Uh, it turns out within general relativity, there are two families of solutions that will potentially allow for uh, a very quick interstellar travel. One is a solution, excuse me, a family of solutions known as wormholes, uh, and another is a family of solutions known as uh, space warps. Um, I think there's some additional things that uh, will be talked about today as well. Um, now the Akubi Air metric uh, is a model that fits into the family of a space warp. And so as a number of you know, I've done some work the last couple of years in terms of uh, sensitivity analysis on the field equations, and this is just a little bit of a refresher. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, but you see here on the screen, this is um, uh, the field equations that uh, Alcubier put out in 94, and then you see to the right uh, a little cartoon of the spacecraft that kind of uh, translates that math into some type of a physical interpretation of what it might look like. Uh, so you see there, there is a little football shape uh, a football-shaped uh, spacecraft right there that would be considered like where the uh, sensitive robotic equipment would be, or if you want to be bold, uh, maybe the crew would be there. And then what's necessary to make the trick work is the presence of this ring around the spacecraft. It would be attached. This is just PowerPoint graphics, so forgive the, uh, uh, the lack of fidelity. But the ring would have uh, something known as uh, exotic matter or negative vacuum energy. Uh, and that, the presence of that is what's necessary to uh, make the idea of a, of a space warp work. Now, the problem we, uh, uh, the pro one of the problems with the idea of a space warp uh, prior to 2011 has been the uh, exceedingly large amount of uh, exotic matter or negative vacuum energy that was necessary uh, to make the idea work. Um, and so that's where we did some work uh, for the DARPA 100-Year Starship Symposium back in 2011. Uh, I was asked to pull together a paper. Uh, that talked about the topic, and uh, so I did a sensitivity analysis and found uh, two mechanisms to reduce uh, the amount of uh, energy uh, that's required for the idea of a space warp. And so what you see here is just a series of stills that go through and show the variation of the expansion and contraction of space across the top. Uh, this is for a 10 meter diameter spacecraft uh, with an effective velocity of 10 C. Uh, and you can see that the expansion and contraction of space uh, changes as we move from a very thin aspect ratio ring. So if you would imagine that ring that goes around the spacecraft, when it looks like a wedding band around your finger, the expansion and contraction of space has to be very high. So in engineering parlance, the strain rate uh, is very, very large. Uh, but what we found with one of the energy optimization techniques is that if you, if you change that topology uh, from something that looks like uh, a wedding band to something that looks a little bit more like, say, a lifesaver, uh, you can reduce the strain on space-time, and so that yields a significant reduction in the amount of energy that's required to accomplish that same thing. So if I were to try and compress this wooden panel here uh, a full quarter inch, I don't have enough chemical energy in my muscles to be able to compress this panel. Uh, but if I only have to compress it, say, a nanometer, I might have enough chemical energy to do that. So by reducing the strain, uh, I reduce the energy requirement, and that makes it uh, a little bit more tractable. And you see the energy density across the bottom there, um, uh, how it's collapsing many, many orders of magnitude. Now the second uh, optimization technique, uh, and this is something I want to highlight because this has some pertinence uh, later in the talk. <clears throat> By going through and expanding uh, the idea of the Alcubier metric into some higher dimensional space time, uh, we did some consideration of the null-like geodesics and found some additional ways to maybe reduce uh, the amount of energy that's required for the idea of a space warp. Uh, and we found that <clears throat> if you oscillate the bubble intensity, you kind of see a, just a, uh, an, an animation trying to illustrate the idea. Uh, if you oscillate the bubble intensity, uh, you reduce the stiffness of space time. So in my little thought experiment, I just talked about compressing this little wooden panel here with my fingers. Uh, the wood is fairly stiff. Uh, if I could change the characteristics of the panel so that it was a bit more, you know, say it's just a, 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 a piece of foam, the stiffness is much less, so that further reduces the amount of energy that's required for the, uh, the, the target strain on space-time. So it was these two optimization techniques uh, that uh, 
helped us maybe uh, reduce the, some of the colossal energy requirements that are identified uh, in the literature. I think the, uh, uh, the lowest prediction was done by Richard uh, a couple years ago. Uh, he reduced, reduced the amount uh, of exotic matter uh, to something about the size of Jupiter. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of pick up the baton where Richard left off. And so this is uh, kind of like the, uh, uh, the summary of the analysis that I did uh, the last couple of years and presented uh, at the last uh, uh, conference. Um, <clears throat> this is for a 10 meter diameter spacecraft with an effective velocity of 10 C. And I can show how that if you make that ring very thin, right, you can yield the solution uh, that requires an enormous amount of exotic matter or negative vacuum energy. Uh, but using these two optimization techniques by changing the topology of the ring and inducing the oscillations. This is a DFTT. So as you move from left to right here, you see some cartoons that show what the ring kind of looks like, relatively speaking, on this log log scale. Uh, and then if you go through and, in, and induce DFDT, you can further reduce the energy requirements. Uh, and in this case, we are able to reduce it to something about the size of the Voyager spacecraft. Now, there's nothing special about 10C or 10 meter diameter spacecraft. And there's nothing special about <clears throat> the Voyager 1 spacecraft in terms of, you know, that's like the absolute net limit. That's not what I'm saying. It was just a way to try and illustrate uh, uh, the benefits of the optimization approach uh, that kind of came out of the, uh, uh, the sensitivity analysis. And I suppose the other important thing to, 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 to mention here is that you know, this sensitivity analysis, I didn't do it to try and find these optimization techniques. They just kind of came out of uh, following uh, curiosity. And so it was kind of a, a useful finding just in the process of, of following curiosity. So, so it was these, uh, <clears throat> it was this uh, significant reduction uh, in energy requirements that encouraged us to go through and uh, uh, think about ways to try and generate uh, some kind of uh, manifestation of this in the lab. So uh, again, let me put a word of caution. This is not something that you're, you know, we're not trying to advocate something that you're going to bolt to a spacecraft. This is just uh, science trying to go through and find maybe existence proof for the application of the physics uh, in a controlled laboratory environment. Uh, but it's kind of like the, the next first step you'd want to take in the process of trying to move from just the math to some type of uh, experimental setup. Uh, so this is a uh, uh, interferometer that's been adapted to try and measure uh, uh, the presence of a warp bubble on an interferometer table. And this is actually a concept uh, Eric and I had talked about years ago, uh, but didn't take any action on because of the uh, colossal energy requirements. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> we dusted this off and came up with some additional software. Uh, Dr. Richard today came up with some software to help uh, uh, diagnose uh, the presence of uh, a warp bubble on the uh, interferometer table. So just to kind of go through uh, what's going on here, you have a laser source. Uh, in this case, it's a helium neon laser. And so it spits out a laser beam that goes to the beam splitter here. Uh, we split that laser light. And once one beam goes down the reference leg of the interferometer, uh, the other beam goes down the uh, active leg of the interferometer. Uh, the light combines and constructively and destructively interferes and then forms an interference pattern uh, at the detector. Now what happens is in the presence of a test device, we're trying to alter uh, the, the path length here uh, for the photons that are going down this leg of the interferometer. And so by changing the path length, we'll see a change in the interference pattern that's seen in the detector. And so you kind of see a, an early numerical simulation uh, of what, uh, what that might look like in terms of the light and dark uh, bands and then some type of change in those uh, with the corresponding uh, presence of a, uh, a field induced by a test article. <clears throat> now, some of the things we've also had to do in terms of trying to pursue this, we have to be very diligent because uh, there's a lot of things you want to make sure that don't uh, uh, reduce the sensitivity of your test setup. Because uh, some of our, uh, what we're trying to work towards now is getting to one one hundredth of a wavelength of sensitivity of light. Uh, so we can measure changes uh, in the path length down to one hundredth of the wavelength of light with the uh, interferometer. We're actually trying to get lower. Uh, we'll talk about some of the additional techniques and hardware that we're putting in place to do that. <clears throat> so, so what we've got is uh, we're using a vibration isolated optical table. I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Uh, we also have a vibration isolated room. I'll show you some pictures of that as well. Uh, we uh, use an optical hood to enclose the, uh, the test setup. Uh, then, of course, we use quite a bit of uh, 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 software to try and uh, uh, analyze uh, the data. 
And then we also gather statistical data as another method of trying to increase the uh, uh, sensitivity of the experimental approach. So this is the uh, this is the setup in the lab we're in today. We were in a different lab uh, about a year ago. Uh, there was too much vibration in that lab, uh, and we couldn't uh, we didn't feel comfortable continuing to pursue that work there. So we uh, uh, we managed to uh, uh, get a home in a a lab that was built back for the Apollo program uh, to work on <coughs> inertial measurement units and so forth. So it's a, a fairly uh, nice lab in terms of very seismically quiet. So the the picture that you're seeing here, this whole lab uh, is seismically isolated. So the whole concrete slab is actually on a, uh, a, a whole bunch of uh, pneumatic piers uh, that will actually float the whole concrete floor. Uh, and then on top of that we have the, uh, uh, the pneumatic tables that we go and activate as well to get further seismic isolation. And so what you see here, this is the interferometer. We'll show a close up of it here in a minute. And then here in the background, we have what's called the time of flight experiment. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So this is the uh, interferometer uh, without the optical hood, so we can illustrate uh, the components. So you've got the laser here. Uh, we've got a beam expander. Uh, this goes through and takes the uh, uh, very small diameter laser beam, and we blow it up to about uh, a one inch in diameter uh, to go through and fully fill uh, the region of interest over here in the test article. Uh, this is the, uh, the beam splitter over here. Uh, the light comes out and we uh, send part of it down here uh, to the off axis mirror. Uh, and then we send the other uh, portion of light through the active region here where we have the test article. Uh, the light comes back and then of course we send it here to the imager. Uh, and this is the computer that collects the imagery and then this is the, uh, uh, the power supply for the test article. So this is what we would call our low fidelity test article. This is a series of uh, barium titanate ceramic capacitors. We're trying to establish a very large uh, potential energy fee uh, that's blue shifted relative to the lab frame. And we're trying to concurrently uh, achieve uh, a, a Lorenz transform with hyperbolic cosine uh, of the target value. And so we're trying to establish those two conditions as close as we can to what we're trying to get to. Uh, so certainly in terms of just changing the topology, there's some challenges with that, uh, so we also want to pull on uh, the DFDT, and we'll talk about that in just a minute in terms of some of the, the testing that we've done to date and the testing that we want to do in the future. <clears throat> uh, this shows the underside of the, the lab here, so this is the, 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 the picture we were just looking at, uh, and then underneath here we have the control panel uh, that goes through and will activate all of the uh, isolators and actually will float the concrete slab uh, to further seismically isolate it. Uh, I suppose the, the, the benefit of the construction is whether the slab is uh, floated or not, it's still very seismically quiet, so it's a, it's a very uh, useful environment to go do the, the testing in. Um, but uh, as a measure of atrophy, it hasn't been used in quite a while, uh, so when we went through the process of getting it uh, reactivated, I had to do some small rebuilding of some of the leveling switches uh, when we first activated the lab and closed the doors, uh, the slab floated up about a half an inch and we couldn't open the doors. <laughs> so <clears throat> we had to uh, uh, have the doors cut so we could actually not get in trouble, right? So. so let's talk about some of the data we've collected to date and some of the analysis techniques. So first let me uh, talk about uh, uh, a concept known as modal analysis, right, going through and trying to increase um, <clears throat> the sensitivity of the test setup. Like I said, we're trying to get to uh, one one hundredth of a wavelength of light. Uh, so this is one of the techniques that helps us get uh, way down in the resolution on uh, the uh, trying to detect some type of a signal. <coughs> so what you see here is a, um, a synthetic series of images to go through and uh, calibrate the, uh, the algorithms. We've got uh, an interference pattern. Uh, you kind of see a, a close-up of the top left of the image. Uh, uh, optically to our eyes, we don't see a, a, a significant difference, but there is a difference between the, 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 the two. And so there's a, an undulating uh, roll of these things. We have about uh, a thousand images that, are, that were stripped to, uh, stitched together to go through and simulate uh, the scenario of turning a device on and off as a function of time uh, and going through and gathering statistical data and then using uh, uh, some DFTs and some FFTs to go through and uh, characterize what are the different different signals that we're seeing uh, uh, in the data. And so what you see, and so this is about uh, 
almost one one hundredth of a wavelength of light in terms of um, uh, the input signal we're putting into the algorithms. And so on the bottom right, you see uh, the, um, <clears throat> the output from the analysis algorithms that goes through and shows that what it, when it looks at this data and does the, uh, uh, the analysis and then spits out the, uh, the Fourier series, uh, you see some, uh, uh, some very uh, strong energy here uh, in the Fourier series expansion, and then you see some uh, uh, small amount of energy over here at the, the Nyquist frequency. And you could potentially see, in, in the real world, you could see some uh, harmonics as well in terms of multiples of the uh, uh, one-fifth and Nyquist frequency. Um, <coughs> so this was kind of our way of making sure that the, uh, the software uh, does what, it, uh, what we want it to do. It, go, it can see uh, some kind of a change uh, in the interference pattern and it'll report that in the, uh, uh, the modal analysis of the data. So this is looking at um, <coughs> some real data. Uh, going through and doing a, a 2D DFT of uh, a portion of the, the data. So you see here on the left, uh, this is an interference pattern from the, from the rig. Uh, and if we go through and take this 128 by 128 window and we do a 2D DFT conversion of it, uh, we get this complex representation of the information. Uh, now, it's, this is useful for us because we can go through and we can sample a small region of this complex representation of the image and we can squash all these other variables uh, down to zero. So that, that eliminates a lot of other unwanted noise. Uh, and then we can go through and we can take that and convert that back into its uh, original uh, configuration, but it's now picked up some complex values because we uh, went through and modified uh, uh, this representation of it. And so the complex values will have the, uh, the phase angle uh, associated with uh, that particular, uh, 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 in this case, that particular pixel. <coughs> so we, uh, we decided to go through and take a look at uh, just one pixel to start with uh, for some data. So here what you, this is uh, what we would call the reference data. So this is uh, a single patch, single pixel modal analysis with a test device off, kind of a reference, right, when nothing's going on. This is what the spectrum looks like. And so you'll notice a little difference from the, <coughs> uh, the previous slide where we've picked up a lot of... Uh, we picked up a lot of noise here uh, in the spectrum, so all these other terms in the Fourier expansion have uh, non-zero exponents, and that has to do with whether it's air handlers or whether it has uh, some oscillation in, in the laser intensity or uh, some vibration or somebody walking down the hallway or, you know, the waves in Galveston Bay, right? Um, <clears throat> so we can go through and, and exercise the device uh, with a known uh, turning on and turning off periodicity uh, and sample the imagery with a known sampling rate. <clears throat> and so here we see, just looking at the single pixel uh, with a test article, test article cycled on and off uh, at uh, a quarter hertz, it's about four seconds. And then taking uh, uh, images every two and a half hertz or uh, at a two and a half hertz rate uh, over uh, around 3,150 uh, samples. Uh, so we should be, we'll be looking for uh, any kind of a change in the spectrum uh, associated with uh, uh, the Nyquist frequency or some multiple of one-fifth of the Nyquist frequency. Uh, and so looking at this particular data, you see that there's a little bit of a bump at uh, uh, around 600 hertz. So you might say, hey, that's kind of exciting. However, uh, when we go back uh, to the test device off, you see that that's there. So that's just part of uh, something in the environment, uh, whether it's something in the air handling equipment or something. Uh, so just taking a look at uh, a single pixel of the image uh, and going through and gathering 3,100 some odd samples, uh, we don't necessarily see anything that we're looking for here. Now one of the concerns we had is that we're just looking at a single pixel, so maybe that's you know, not sufficient. We want to try and sample uh, more of the image. Uh, so we uh, also went through and looked at um, taking more data uh, across the image at different locations and trying to build a, a better statistical representation of anything that's going on. <clears throat> so here we have, uh, uh, again, cycling the test article on and off uh, every four seconds, uh, capturing a frame every quarter second, and uh, around just a little over 3,100 samples. Um, and then we're looking at the, uh, uh, a much larger cross-section of the image. We're looking at uh, 88 points uh, throughout the image plane, uh, trying to get a better representation of the information.
So this is the uh, reference baseline. Uh, this is with the test article off. Uh, the one thing you'll notice is that by taking uh, more data, more samples across the uh, image, um, we're getting a lot more statistical data, uh, and so we're beating down uh, some of the noise, so the spectrum looks a little cleaner. <coughs> and so anything, this right here is just a little over that Nyquist frequency. So everything on this side is a mirror image of everything on that side. So you can see everything on this side is just a complex conjugate of that. So this is with the device uh, always off. Uh, and this is with the device uh, cycled, as we mentioned. Uh, when you look at the spectrum close up, uh, there is some small energy we pick up uh, uh, in a couple spots in the spectrum that's a, a multiple of the Nyquist, that's going to be one-fifth the Nyquist frequency. So we're seeing a little bit of energy uh, appear uh, in some of the Fourier series uh, that was not there uh, with the device off. Uh, so that's some interesting uh, findings, but uh, certainly not conclusive. Uh, we wanted to go through and do some additional work uh, with trying to put, instead of run, running the beam through the bore uh, of a test article, uh, we wanted to go through and actually put a very large potential field directly in the beam path. Um, in a perfect world, you'd like to be able to stick, in this case, the ceramic capacitor directly in the beam path, but it's not transparent, so you have to try and find a different way to do that. Uh, so we established a very large uh, uh, air capacitor, an air dielectric, so we uh, set up a very large potential field uh, directly in the beam path uh, around uh, 20,000 volts. Uh, and so you kind of see the, the, the setup that we had to try and establish the, the large potential field uh, directly on the, uh, the beam path. <coughs> and then we cycled it uh, in a similar fashion um, uh, to go through to gather some statistical data. And so this is the, uh, the test results uh, with the device always off. Uh, so this is what the spectrum looks like. It's uh, uh, not quite as many samples as the, uh, the, the previous data set. Um, just a little over uh, 750 almost. And this is the change in the spectrum uh, with the device being cycled. Uh, so you see the Nyquist frequency at uh, 369.5. Uh, then we see uh, some potential energy uh, around uh, one-fifth of uh, the Nyquist frequency. Um, so let me go back and show you. There's also a change in the characteristics of uh, the frequency uh, uh, in the 300 to 400 range. So there is a little bit of change there uh, as we turn the device. Uh, we go through the process of cycling. Uh, we pick up uh, uh, something interesting, uh, but again, not definitive. It could still be uh, just noise. <clears throat> so in parallel with us, uh, we have a, uh, a sister lab up at South Dakota State University. Uh, Dan Neelick, uh, was, uh did a summer term uh, in our lab while we were setting up the interferometer. Uh, and so he went back to South Dakota State uh, and also set up uh, a, a duplicate uh, uh, experimental approach to what we were doing, uh, but using some different uh, analytic techniques. So this is uh, his experimental setup. Uh, you've got uh, very similar to what we have. Uh, you've got the, the laser, the, the, the beam splitter, uh, and then he's got his uh, detector uh, over there on the right. Uh, you see a close-up of the test device, uh, very similar to what we have. I think he even has the exact same uh, uh, barium titanate ceramic capacitors there embedded uh, in the uh, in the test article there. So you see a reference uh, interference pattern from running his device. Uh, now he did things uh, a little differently. He, uh, he looked at um, how does the fringe change uh, as you charge and discharge the device. So he specifically focused on the charging and discharging portion uh, of the test device in terms of what happens uh, to And uh, the technique that he used in terms of the data we're fixing to look at is he used a subtraction technique. So just to describe to you, if you have an image uh, that it's a, it's a piece of digital information, it's a matrix of numbers uh, that represent the intensity on a pixel by pixel basis. Uh, and so he takes the uh, one image and then the next subsequent image, he can go through and subtract that subsequent image from the first one. And so what happens if there's no change whatsoever uh, then the, uh, the matrix that results in the subtraction is zero. So the average intensity of the difference between the two would be zero. Uh, so if there's some change in the interference pattern from one frame to the next, then that would be represented as a non-zero difference. Uh, so that's kind of the technique he's using for this first analysis approach, uh, where he's going through and taking uh, difference images uh, sequentially as he runs through the process of uh, uh, charging up and discharging uh, the test article. 
around 2,200 data points. Uh, each point represents uh, 20 separate uh, uh, data points. Uh, and so he's got uh, a reference baseline uh, and then a, a, a series of data for charging and then a series of data for discharging the, the test article. Uh, so what you see here on the top, <clears throat> this is the uh, this is the process that uh, this is the baseline, right? There's uh, it's very stable. There's no changing as a function of time, which is what you want to see for the control. Uh, now, when you look at the subtraction method for the charging cycle, going from uh, zero to 19,000 volts, uh, you see that there is a change uh, in uh, the uh, in the data uh, that's being processed by the algorithm. Uh, you can look at the slope here, and the slope is about uh, almost an order of magnitude. Uh, higher than the uh, uh, slope associated with the baseline. Uh, the discharging similarly also has uh, uh, a changing slope here, so there's something going on in the information. So there, there is a change in the information as a function of time, and that too is similarly about uh, an order of magnitude higher uh, than the baseline. <clears throat> so this potentially could be some indications of one of the threads we wanted to pull on, which was the dependency of the energy optimization of DFDT. Right? One of the techniques to reduce the uh, amount of energy that's required uh, was to go through and change the topology uh, of the uh, of the ring that we were talking about. Uh, and then the second thing is to go through and establish a very large varying potential DFDT. Uh, so uh, curious enough, this might potentially be uh, some initial indications, but uh, uh, definitely not definitive. Um, he went through and did some additional analysis to go through and, and more directly uh, quantify if indeed the, f the, the interference or not. And so the <clears throat> what he finds is that uh, there is uh, a, a pixel per frame value for the charging and discharging uh, that is uh, uh, larger than for the reference baseline. So there is uh, some movement of the uh, interference pattern in the process uh, associated with charging and discharging the device. <clears throat> so let's see how I'm doing on time. In terms of some of the additional things that we're trying to do uh, to um, uh, increase our, our sensitivity, we talked about one one hundredth of a wavelength, right, and that's, that's fairly challenging, and I think we're getting right at that value now, uh, but one of the things we want to look at is also doing image averaging. However, one of the challenges associated with that is this image is fairly repetitive, right, there's not a lot of distinguishing characteristics, uh, and so just like it would be hard for you to be able to correlate one image from one to the other uh, uh, based on our optical capabilities. Uh, computer algorithms would have some challenges with it. And then you run into the question of in the process of trying to register image to image if there's some vibration you're trying to get rid of and then you average those, are you actually losing information? Uh, so it's one of the things you have to be very careful about in, in terms of doing image averaging. Uh, you could potentially smear out the very data you're trying to tease out the noise. Uh, but uh, there are some software algorithms that are out there that are used in astronomy. And so just to show you, uh, if you look uh, here, there's some dust motes. Uh, when we go through and run them through some uh, image averaging software, you can see that the dust motes become a, a little bit uh, uh, more pronounced. Uh, so that's potentially one technique we're looking at trying to increase uh, the sensitivity of the test setups that we're using. Now, the other thing we're looking at, uh, George Katsopoulos was a uh, graduate student with us this summer from the International Space University. Uh, and he came up with the idea of adapting a Fabry-Perot interferometer uh, to go through and try and do some work with uh, uh, trying to measure the, the uh, change in the beam path length. Uh, and so what you see here is a schematic of how a Fabry-Perot interferometer works. It's a little different from a, a Michelson. Uh, you've got a distributed source here uh, that comes into what's called the uh, etalon. And so the etalon are two mirrors that are uh, uh, in close proximity that take that uh, incoming beam and it bounces back and forth many times uh, between the mirrors and then is sent to the detector. Uh, so the, the, the benefit of this is, is like image averaging uh, where the constructive and destructive interference is reinforced. Um, it's like image averaging without software and you're not losing information. 
Uh, so you see here on the left, this is what an interference pattern might look like in a Michelson from a sodium source. Uh, but if you look at the same uh, interference pattern uh, on an etalon, you see this, uh, this double ring structure, and that's representative of the, uh, the doublet, the, the fact that there's atomic structure uh, in sodium. So there is a potential with the Fabry Perot that we can break the 1 100th one of a wavelength uh, and get down uh, to uh, maybe uh, less than that. Uh, and so here we've got uh, some initial uh, process of getting used to running the, the Fabry Pro interferometer. Will be <coughs> this is the Fabry Pro interferometer right here. This is a laser source. Uh, we'll eventually put a test article and embed the Fabry Pro interferometer directly uh, in the bore of the test article. Uh, and then this is the time of flight uh, experiment. This is a different way to measure the phenomena. So the interferometer is trying to go through and measure. Uh, a change in optical path length uh, by looking at how the interference pattern has changed. Uh, this would be looking at uh, uh, seeing if there's a change in how long it takes a photon to run through uh, a, a, little, uh, a little course of mirrors. And so you see we've got uh, a laser source here. We run that through a modulator, and so it's like a, a, an electric uh, chopper, and it creates a light pulse that comes out. Uh, it splits the light pulse. Uh, one light pulse goes to one detector, the other light pulse runs through the, the racetrack here and goes to the detector. And so you would have a start and finish associated with the device off, and then you could run the same test with the device on and see if there's some change in the time it takes a photon to run through that, uh, uh, that course. So it's a different way uh, to measure the data. So in the process of trying to explore this, you want to make sure you don't get any false positives. So this is just a different way to try and explore it to see if you're seeing uh, similar characteristics. Uh, so this is a picture of the time of flight facility. Uh, we've got the two uh, optical detectors there. There's the uh, chopper that's there with the laser source, and it runs through the, the mirrors here, and we can expand and contract the, uh, the beam length uh, as appropriate. <coughs> so moving forward, uh, so we've got two separate labs that have been working on this, uh, uh, and I think uh, we've got some potential non-null results uh, intriguing um, uh, in two different uh, interferometer setups using uh, three different uh, analysis techniques uh, that do indicate a potential change in beam path length, uh, uh, a little bit more uh, intensity with the DFDT. Uh, however, these results are uh, far from conclusive, and it's uh, way too early to, to say anything definitive. And so we'll, uh, we'll be continuing to investigate uh, uh, this with some additional techniques and some software approaches. Uh, so in terms of the what we call our low fidelity approach, just uh, not pulling on the D, not pulling on the DFDT thread. Uh, we'll continue to work with larger data sample sets to try and decrease the effect of vibrational noise, uh, and then we will um, uh, develop test articles uh, with longer regions of optical influence. So instead of just a single ring, maybe we'll have uh, ten rings. Uh, so we'll have a, a much longer tube uh, that would increase the magnitude of the effect potentially by an order of magnitude. So just like we're trying to get down to below one one hundredth of a wavelength. Another approach is to increase the magnitude of the effect uh, by an order of magnitude. Uh, again, using image averaging, uh, and then uh, certainly we want to go through and explore what, we'll, what, what the capabilities we can have with uh, using the Fabry Pro interferometer with some software. Uh, now, what we really want to pull on is we want to pull on the, uh, uh, the DFDT dependency in our future test articles. Uh, we, um, we've seen some hints that uh, that may be, uh, we might have seen some indications of that in the lab. Uh, now, the, the unforeseen intersection of some of the work that we're doing was the fact that there is this dependency on DFDT from the energy optimization analysis, uh, and uh, also the need for uh, negative vacuum energy. Um, so both of these characteristics are present in another line of technology we're working on called uh, Q-thrusters. Uh, so let me talk about those now. Uh, now, in terms of moving forward, we'll want to try and adapt uh, some of the physics to guide some construction of test articles. Uh, that we would put into some of the different uh, uh, experimental setups we have to see if we can't uh, increase the magnitude of the effect. So let me talk a little bit about Q-thrusters and help you understand where we are with those and why we're uh, uh, encouraged with the physics models and the data we've collected to date with those. Now, a Q-thruster is a form of electric propulsion, much like a, say, you know, Hall thruster is a form of electric propulsion that has a, a, a low thrust uh, but a, a very efficient uh, system. But in this case, a Q-thruster works off the principle of pushing off the quantum vacuum. Now, a mental analog for this is to think about a submarine that's in the water. Uh, it has a propeller on the back. It doesn't uh, carry a big tank of seawater and then push that seawater 
out the back uh, to generate uh, momentum. It just uses the propeller to couple with the, the medium that it's embedded in. Uh, similarly with the a Q thruster, it pushes off the quantum vacuum. Uh, we use the tools of Magneto Hydrodynamics to uh, model uh, this interaction. Uh, so the quantum vacuum pushes off the, uh, the sea of virtual particles that pop into and out of existence. I think Richard gave a, uh, a good uh, primer for me this morning about you know, what is the quantum vacuum. We know from quantum mechanics that the quantum vacuum is not empty. It's full of these virtual particles that pop into and out of existence. Um, <coughs> Now the idea of pushing off the quantum vacuum is not new. I certainly am not the first person to come up with it. It's been in the literature for uh, many decades. Um, however, the magnitude of the force has been uh, one of the principal obstacles uh, to be able to try and use this in any manner for exploration that we would think about. Uh, now some of the work we've been doing with some of our theoretical models uh, and some of the experimental data suggests that we uh, are potentially getting this technology where it could be useful for, in our case, human space flight. Uh, we've got some data that shows that uh, we've got some uh, good experience in the 0.1 to 1 newtons per kilowatt, uh, and then we've got some experience in the uh, a little bit over 10 newtons per kilowatt. Now, as part of an additional validation of some of the stuff that we're doing, uh, you know, you can also go through and compare your physics models to known data uh, that's been collected uh, over the centuries. Uh, we know the gravitational constant to an exceeding high value. Uh, we know the Bohr radius of the hydrogen atom to exceeding high value. And so the models that we have uh, predict uh, a Bohr radius of 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11th exactly. Uh, similarly, they uh, predict uh, an electron mass of 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31st kilograms. So that's encouraging uh, that we can reproduce those numbers as part of the mechanism, excuse me, the models that uh, underlie the construction of a cube thruster. Now what you see here is uh, an experimental setup that we use to go through and measure uh, the force uh, generated by some of the test articles that we're working with in this quantum vacuum plasma thruster. Uh, there's a vacuum chamber uh, that's over here on the left, uh, the support rack that's here, and then this goes through and shows the sensitivity of the system. Uh, we've got this low thrust torsion pendulum here, uh, liquid metal contacts, uh, so there's no cables that go across the interface, uh, uh, optical displacement measurements, so there's nothing that touches the torsion pendulum. We want to make sure we isolate it in every way possible from the environment. Uh, this particular, you see a, just a test article that's in there with a Faraday cage shielding around all the support equipment. Uh, this goes through and shows the sensitivity of the device. We can d measure down to single digit micronewtons real time without any uh, signal averaging. Uh, just to put that in context, you know, six micronewtons is if I were to cut the antennas off a mosquito and put them on a scale. So, fairly sensitive. We can actually see the, the if it's a windy day, we can actually tell you because we pick up the change in the seismic environment from uh, the waves in the, the, the bay. Uh, you kind of see a portfolio of some of the different test devices we've worked, worked with over the years. We've got uh, a good amount of experience uh, with uh, working in a, uh, from the uh, 100 to a few thousand micronewtons. Uh, the specific force values, certainly in the, the 0.1 to 1 newton per kilowatt range. Um, we just finished uh, some testing here on the left. Uh, we had a guest device in from uh, industry uh, and uh, we were asked to go through and evaluate that with some of our uh, partner agencies. Um, <clears throat> and so that test experience, we were able to, uh, 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 after we did everything to try and eliminate any other sort of thrust, uh, generate 20 to 110 micronewton thrust pulses with a thrust to power ratio of around 1 to 20 newtons per kilowatt. Uh, and then we've got some additional testing we'll be doing in the future, trying to work uh, at very high uh, RF frequencies. Uh, matter of fact, when I get back on Monday, we have test articles waiting for us to get busy. Uh, in terms of different applications for some of the numbers I've been throwing at you, what does 0.1 newton per kilowatt mean uh, for space exploration? What does 10 newtons per kilowatt mean for space exploration? And you kind of see some of the things that we've been thinking about, and I'll back this up with some of the mission analysis we've been doing to try and understand the value proposition. Um, uh, 0.1 newtons per kilowatt is on the bottom there. It's going to be predominantly associated with in-space propulsion. Uh, and then when you get to 10 newtons per kilowatt, you can come up with some additional approaches uh, that uh, might be useful. Um, uh, but certainly, uh, from our perspective, 0.1 newtons per kilowatt is uh, potentially a little easier from a technology perspective. Uh, and I think we've got uh, a good indication of the value proposition for 0.1 newtons per kilowatt. So I'm going to talk about some emission analysis that we had. Uh, Udravov Pika, another International Space University student that was with us uh, this summer, uh, using Copernicus. Copernicus is a trajectory analysis tool that's used uh, across the agency, a uh, very high fidelity analysis tool. And so we went through and looked at modeling uh, some different missions using a uh, effectively a single heavy lift, a 90 ton spacecraft, uh, 50 tons of cargo. Um, it's got two megawatt power, 
two, two megawatts of nuclear power uh, at 10 kilograms per kilowatt. So for folks that are versed with nuclear reactors, that's not overly exotic. That's just we know what's necessary to go make a, uh, that kind of a reactor. Uh, and then uh, 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 20 tons associated with uh, uh, the propulsion system uh, in terms of, you know, 10,000 of these little uh, Q thrusters bolted to a board for uh, a, the least elegant way of trying to scale it up. <clears throat> Uh, so looking at uh, Mars mission, uh, we can potentially, with this uh, single heavy lift vehicle, it could do a, a low thrust trajectory to Mars at 0.4 newtons per kilowatt on a pretty reasonable time. Uh, and with a, now the 70 day stay is just arbitrary, just to try and understand uh, uh, closing the mission. So the return trip's a little long, 110. It might be good just to go ahead and expand the stay. But uh, 4 newtons per kilowatt's a little better. I'm running low on time, so let me cruise through here. Uh, we wanted to look at all the destinations in the solar system for this same spacecraft. So it's 50 tons of cargo, 20 tons power, 20 tons propulsion. Uh, a mission to Jupiter, and these are all capture, we're not flybys. So you accelerate halfway and you decelerate halfway. Uh, you got the transit times uh, pretty reasonable for the 0.4 newtons per kilowatt. You're starting to see some benefit for the 4 newtons per kilowatt. Going all the way out to the outer solar system to, <coughs> excuse me, Neptune. It's uh, 492 days. You're starting to get to the limit where the 0.4 newtons per kilowatt is uh, either you need more power or you need to do something different. The 4 newtons per kilowatt can still do that within transit times associated with DRA 5.0. Uh, and then Pluto, uh, of course, it's around almost uh, 50 AU. Uh, and then we also wanted to look at uh, the JPL, uh, Interstellar Precursor, 1000 AU, uh, with uh, this same spacecraft uh, at uh, 0.4 newtons per kilowatt. That's uh, 5.6 years to get out to 1000 AU. Uh, Voyager 1 is at uh, 120 astronomical AU, uh, and it's been taking it uh, a little over 30 years, so it's a, a potentially a, a good improvement for robotic exploration. Uh, and then we did do a trajectory analysis for an interstellar mission, so this is um, just with the Q thrusters. Uh, so uh, in terms of, and this is capture, this is accelerating and decelerating halfway. Uh, at 0.4 newtons per kilowatt, we're just a little over 122.5 years. I think the important thing is that uh, Copernicus, we didn't realize this, but we worked with Caesar and Campu at uh, University of Texas, uh, and Copernicus can natively handle uh, galactic coordinates, so you can actually put in any galactic destination and it will actually be able to solve for a trajectory. Uh, so it was kind of a useful finding. Um, now I'm going to kind of finish with this. <clears throat> this is a little bit of life imitating art. Uh, so as part of trying to uh, uh, take some of the findings uh, from the last couple of years and try and uh, uh, articulate that in a, in a visual way. Uh, I worked with uh, Mark Rademacher and Mike Akuda to go through and update some historical artwork uh, from the 60s. So this is a concept uh, from, that was made by Matthew Jeffries. He's the guy that came up with the familiar look and feel uh, of the Enterprise. Uh, he also had this concept and I think uh, Gene Roddenberry was kind of fond of it. Uh, but you can see there's a few things that might be wrong with it from uh, uh, the things I just talked about. The rings are very thin, so they're going to require an enormous amount of exotic matter to work. Uh, but more importantly, the fenning region that's formed, the warp bubble that's formed as a result of these two rings, would be kind of like a hot dog shape. Uh, so when they turn on the warp field for this spacecraft, it would cut the bridge off here on the front, and the bridge would go floating away, and Scotty would be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> now this is an update of the little, uh, the concept working with uh, Mike Akuda and Mark Rademacher, uh, where we go through, and the rings are much more athletic in this case. This is, you know, just going through and articulating the physics. Uh, the rings are considerably thicker. Uh, and then the spacecraft, instead of sticking out, uh, is well within what would be considered the fitting region, so all the bits are, are where they need to be. Uh, and it's a lot fuller. You're not going to waste this space. It takes energy uh, for both the thickness of the bubble and the radius of the bubble, so you'd fill it with uh, everything you could. And then, <clears throat> The important thing is, based on the, the work I did in 2003 to put the uh, Alcubierre metric into canonical form, you still have to have a main propulsion system. Uh, so here, you know, we're still going to need some form of propulsion that's going to provide an initial velocity that helps uh, uh, the process work. So I, I think in, in terms of a good intersection, I want to go off what Kelvin was saying yesterday, right? Uh, we, some of the propulsion systems that we're looking at for uh, even the longer missions, uh, we're still going to need propulsion systems for the idea of a space warp in terms of, uh, based on the work I did in 2003. 